Thank you. Thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Alan Madden, Gadigalolda. Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, just had a quick look around and I'm feeling happy here. I can see a lot of my mob, the old grey head mob. Uh, well, they, what, what is that? It's a sign of distinction, they, they say, the sale grade. But my, my, I've got $2 haircuts. I just get the black taken out. <laughs> I'm pretty happy with that. For my first song, <laughs> nah. I've just seen if you fellas are awake after a hard day in work today. First and foremost, as we've all welcomed the countries, is is to acknowledge our Aboriginal elders, all elders, past and present, and pay my respects to all our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters from whatever Aboriginal or island nation you may have come from, welcome to Gadigal. And to all our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters here this evening, a very warm and sincere welcome to you, no matter where you've come from, whether it be across the seas, across the state or across town, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. And as I've mentioned many times before, was, is, and always will be Aboriginal land. Only three things shorter than that, coming, taxation and going. It is an honour and pleasure to be here this evening to welcome one and all to Gadigal. Gadigal is one of 29 clans of the Eora Nation. The Eora Nation is bounded by nature's own. The Hawkesbury River to the north. The mobs up that way call it the Darkenjung. The Pian to the west, the Derebin. And George's River to the south, Kaimai. And in between those three mighty rivers is the Eora Nation. And in that nation, there are 29 clans. And the clan's land we're on this evening is Gadigal. On behalf of members of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, once again, a very warm and sincere welcome to you to Gadigal. There's an old saying out there, I think it's very appropriate for you fellows here tonight. You've heard it a thousand times before. They say, where there's a will, there's relatives. So once again, on behalf of Land Council and of the Gadigal mob, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uncle Alan. The Warren Center has hosted the Innovation Lecture now for 22 years. And we've undertaken work supporting Australia's innovation ecosystem for 34 years. We thank tonight's sponsors, Lang O'Rourke and the Faculty of Engineering and IT at the University of Sydney. Uh, this event would not be possible without their generous support. Uh, the Warren Center Innovation Lecture is also part of Spark Festival. Uh, supported by Jobs for New South Wales and the City of Sydney, Spark Festival is a program of over 100 events and it's Australia's largest gathering for startups, innovators, and entrepreneurs. Uh, make sure you check out the program. There are events every day this week, running until the 22nd, I believe, and uh, there are terrific events out there. It's a privilege now to introduce the Honorable Matthew Keane, Minister for Innovation and Better Regulation, to give the formal welcome to tonight's event. Minister Keane. Well, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, can I too start by acknowledging country, the traditional owners on the land on which we stand today, and their elders, both past and present. And I think you'll agree, Uncle Alan, that was one of the best welcome to countries I've heard. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you, it's a great honor to have you here tonight. Can I just say, uh, before I begin talking a bit about one part of my portfolio, innovation, the reason I was a bit late in delaying you, forcing you to have a bit of an extended drink session, is because I was on a phone interview in my better regulation capacity. 
because we've just got our bill, or got, just got changed the laws in New South Wales to extend expiry dates on gift cards. So we think that's a bit innovative. But um, <laughs> the other bit of my portfolio is probably the most exciting bit, and it's the bit that will transform our nation, and that's the innovation space. We think things are pretty good in New South Wales at the moment. You'd expect me as a member of the New South Wales government to be plugging our success. But we have good economic conditions. Uh, there's low unemployment and we've got the fastest rate of economic growth in the country. And that's been underpinned for many years by our investment in infrastructure, for example, high commodity prices and the mining boom. But those good times cannot last forever. And the reality is our economy is in transition. So we can no longer rely on our natural advantages of resources and agricultural to underpin our success. The reality is we need to find new ways to grow our prosperity. We need to be able to create new jobs. I mean, all the statistics show that by 2025, half the jobs as we know them will be automated. So there will be a large number of people, a huge cross-section of our community that will be displaced. And that's where the innovation agenda comes in. We need to find new ways to create those jobs that will be displaced. We need to find ways to educate our labour force, to enable them to take advantage of the opportunities that the technology is bringing. And that's not just the work of government. That's not just the work of industry. That's also the work of our universities. And there is no better example of a university leading the way than Sydney University, and particularly what's going on, what has gone on, and what will continue to go on at the Warren Centre. And that's tonight going to be highlighted in our lecture. Tonight is all about looking to the future, looking at what those opportunities are, and focusing on the innovation agenda and how it's going to not only transform our state, not only going to transform our country, but it's going to transform the world. We're already seeing technology disrupting every aspect of our lives, from how we communicate, to how we're treated in, in, in our hospitals. Every facet of our lives is being upended because of technology. And we need to be more agile, we need to be more innovative if we're going to be able to compete with the best in the world. Now, I've just come back from Israel and I've seen for myself what is happening at the cutting edge. And let me tell you, if we don't all work together here in Australia, we're gonna be left behind. We'll be a rust bucket state. So tonight, my appeal to each and every one of you in the room here tonight is that it's not just government's responsibility to position ourselves for the future. It's not just industry's responsibility and it's certainly not just our um, academic sector's responsibility. If we're going to win the ideas battle, we need to all work together. There is too much at stake to lose. Unlike the mining boom, the ideas boom can last forever. So tonight, I hope that we'll renew our focus, renew our energy in coming together to continue to take advantage of the technological revolution that is here, continue to drive the innovation agenda, to set our country up for success, and to make sure that we continue to be the greatest country on earth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister. We look forward to continuing to work with uh, New South Wales government to, to drive innovation. Um, as you know, and as the Minister just said, innovation has never been more obvious in the Australian economy than it is today. Uh, we see innovation and disruption driving unprecedented, unprecedented level of change and opportunity. And though construction is a long-standing industry, uh, since the beginning of time we've been constructing, uh, tonight's lecture is going to illustrate how even bricks and mortar can face a revolution. Not the bricks and mortar stores, but the ones out there slinging it. Professor Andrew Harris is an innovator in the way that he seeks to transform construction from within the industry with Lango Rourke, and also in his work on translational research to link academic thinking to industrial challenges. Um, Andrew is, is a director of the Laboratory for Sustainable Technology, a professor at the School of Chemical and Biomedical Engineering, 
Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Sydney, and he's the Australian Director of Lang O'Rourke's Future Engineering and Innovation Consultancy, the Engineering Excellence Group. At the University of Sydney, Andrew's research is focused on developing cutting-edge technologies to assist with the transition to sustainability. His research typically occurs at the interface between established scientific disciplines, chemistry, physics, biology, engineering, and material science. By working at the intersection of these disciplines, Andrew is able to adopt a multi-scale, multidisciplinary approach. It is this approach that has enabled him to, tr to explore truly innovative solutions in large-scale, complex construction projects at Lang O'Rourke. Lang O'Rourke is Australia's largest private engineering and construction business, with local turnover of about $3 billion per year. The organization is an internationally focused engineering enterprise with world-class capabilities spanning the entire client value chain. Lang O'Rourke offers single source solutions providing services across engineering, construction, and asset management services for some of the world's most prestigious public and private organizations. Lang O'Rourke funds, designs, manufactures, constructs, and maintains the built environment, providing the facilities to accommodate, educate, employ, transport, care for, and sustain communities. Andrew is a non-executive director of Hazer Group, a listed clean tech company, and he serves on the industry advisory board for the Australian Research Council Center for Robotic Vision. Andrew received his PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2002. He is a chartered engineer and a fellow of the Institute of Chemical Engineers and a fellow of the Engineers Australia. In 2006, Andrew received the Shedden Uta Medal and prize as the leading early career chemical engineer in Australia and New Zealand, and he was recognized last year as one of Australia's 50 most innovative engineers by Engineers Australia in 2007. Uh, please join me in welcoming Andrew to the stage. Uh, good, e good evening, everyone. Can you hear me all right? I'm always nervous when people clap at the beginning of a talk. Um, in case it doesn't end very well, you should hold your applause to the end. Um, so, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, the very clever people at the Warren Center and, and I were talking about what we should cover tonight in the lecture. Um, and uh, I gave them a long paragraph of the stuff that I wanted to talk about. And I have a little confession to make. I'm, I'm universally regarded by my colleagues as the worst author of talk titles in the known universe, right? You'll, you'll see that in a second. And the folks at the Warren Center translated what I said and they came up with this. So, um, so my apologies to the Warren Center. I don't want to talk about that at all. Um, this, uh, this was the original title for my talk. I, I want to cover off innovation broadly and, and disruptive innovation in particular and its impacts on survival. And not survival of the human race, but survival of uh, your business and by implication the country's survival and the minister has just covered off on that now so we can actually skip that part we don't need to do that so um, and then I want to use some examples from engineering and construction to illustrate what that looks like and what it could look like so um, point two and and I also want to make some uh, some observations about how our universities um, uh, and industry interact and some of the limitations that exist there and how we how we need to overcome those um, and then I want to just explore a little bit um, some of the implications for your career or uh, because this is a Warren Center audience for your grandkids' uh, careers. Yeah. Uh, that was just supposed to be gentle. It's not that bad. You didn't need to groan, sir. That was, uh, was unkind. Um, so a couple, of, a couple of prefacing remarks. I just need to explain these um, before we get into the, what we're going to talk about. Uh, I think management theorists and academics and other experts overcomplicate innovation. Right? Uh, it's, not that, it's not that complicated. There are only two types. There is incremental innovation, doing tomorrow what you did today a little bit better, and that's everybody's job every day. Uh, and then the other type is disruptive. That's the, oh crap, I didn't see that coming. That has fundamentally transformed my job, career, life, whatever, right? So my, um, my interests are around disruptive innovation, and that, that is the one that um, I'm gonna explore mostly um, today. The second part of that, um, engineering construction, uh, it's a bit risky, right? So the, um, uh, the sharp eared amongst you will have heard that I'm a chemical engineer uh, and I'm working in a construction industry. And normally those two things don't go together, number one. And then number two, we, we largely build 
um, stuff. The same way today that the aliens who built the pyramids 5,000 years ago built the pyramids, right? It really hasn't changed very much. So that's a sort of a risky example set to illustrate clever stuff that's going on. Um, so point three, um, Australia is, it's very well acknowledged now. There are lots of data sets and they're very consistent. Australia is really good at publishing papers and doing the, um, the initial discovery bit. Uh, it's not so great at translating that research out of the research providers, the universities, CSIRO, et cetera, and turning it into value, uh, however you want to define value. Um, so there's an opportunity there for us as a country. And then the career bits, or your kids' careers, or your grandkids' careers, will, uh, will come to at the end. So I hope that's all right. That's what I'm going to do. Um, first thing, and I, as, I, as we go forward, I'm going to step forward in time. So I'm going to start today with things that exist today, and then I'm going to work forward in time for things that will exist at some stage in the future as we get to the back end. All right? Um, so the first thing that I need to do is just give you a quick overview of um, some of the work that Langer Rourke does in Australia and globally. And the reason I'm doing that is I have an unusual career. I've decided to exist between industry and academia um, and, and make myself an expert in that space. Um, so in my university life, I grow gold on trees and reverse engineer butterflies and do really unusual, very, very cutting edge, 20 year horizon kind of pieces of research. Um, at Langer Rourke, and I've been with Langer Rourke for about seven years, I uh, helped set up and now, and now I'm a director of um, a translational research uh, center that takes the best ideas from wherever they are um, and then turns them into things that get deployed on projects. And so these projects that I'm showing you here um, are the test environment, my living laboratory, if you like. Um, and I think all translational research requires both of those things. And we'll come back to that at the end. So Langer Rourke is a little uh, Australian construction company uh, headquartered in the UK, uh, where it um, has provenance going back more than 100 years, uh, and has been in Australia in one form or another for, for, for many decades, sort of 30 or 40 years now. Um, and they do large buildings, uh, mining, mineral processing, uh, oil and gas, including working on what was the world's largest construction project at the time. Um, uh, transport infrastructure, level crossing removals in Victoria, um, the uh, completion of a the Pacific Highway, Australia's largest regional infrastructure project, where we do no construction at all. We're simply uh, managing the program of work. Um, uh, the, the extension of the Northern Line in the UK, that's uh, Battersea Power Station in the top left-hand corner there. Um, more rail projects in Hong Kong. Uh, this is um, the new convention center uh, in Kowloon. Um, interesting, that photograph is taken from underneath that. So when you look at it from the bottom. And I, I really love this picture. Uh, there is a live railway line that runs across the top of that photograph, and there is a train every 30 seconds in peak. So I, I, don't, uh, I don't speak Mandarin very well, and I certainly don't read it very well, but I'm pretty sure the signs on the bottom of those supporting columns say, do not knock this with an excavator. Um, uh, and uh, all sorts of transport industry, including um, um, uh, lots of work at Heathrow, uh, social and economic infrastructure, including uh, helping with the renewal of the Opera House. Um, and program management of the London Olympics. Um, so there is lots and lots of space to play in there. It's, uh, it's actually really good fun, and I hope you see it as we go through. Uh, and of course, uh, defense in Australia. We do lots of defense work, including small planes and large planes. There we go. OK, so I uh, mentioned construction. And this is the only academic slide that has lots of text on it. Everything else is just uh, photographs. I apologize for that. The reason that's there. Um, Two chief scientists ago, our chief scientist gave a lecture about the importance of construction in uh, Australia. Um, and uh, people don't realize it very much, and I just wanted to share with you some facts. So the, the most recent data, uh, construction contributes about 8% of GDP directly in Australia. But when you look at the upstream and downstream supply chains, so design services, manufactured com new components, it's about 20% of gross value add across the, across the country. It's the third largest employer, the largest employer of young people, which I think is particularly significant um, because unemployment rates across the demographic of the population are worse at uh, younger levels. Um, uh, uh, and it also has a reasonably challenging OHS environment. So we employ lots of people. They're largely unskilled jobs. Um, and we know now that those jobs won't exist like they do in the future. Um, 
Number one, nobody wants to work in an environment where they get hurt at work. It's just not appropriate. Uh, and number two, you're likely to see the jobs automated out. Um, and there are massive implications for us as a country uh, if, we, um, if we don't get this right. So that's why this is a really good case study for disruptive innovation. Um, and a couple of observations on that really quickly. This is a piece of work done by some investment bankers a couple of years ago, um, based upon the work of a Russian mathematician called Kondratiev. Um, so it looks at the US share market uh, and these super cycles going back uh, a couple of hundred years. Um, and the periods of exponential growth, which is what you see there, are always related to some sort of disruptive innovation explosion. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, the advent of the railways, the electrical engineering and chemicals revolution, um, automobiles, IT. Now the point of showing you this is that we are due another one of these. In fact, we're not due, we're overdue another one of these. So something is coming. We can speculate about what it is. Is it uh, the Internet of Things? Is it biotechnology? Is it nano? Um, it, it could be any or all of those things. Um, but something is coming. And uh, we, um, as a country now, are going to be in big trouble if we, don't, uh, if we don't get ready for that and take advantage of it. All right. So the, um, that's the prefacing stuff. I hope that sets it up for what we're going to show now. Now we get on to the fun stuff. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you how a construction project in the future will get delivered. And I'm using examples from today. And then I'm going to step forward and I'll share some stuff with you at the end that, that come out of the lab and are a bit science fiction-y rather than off, off one of the job sites. So the very first thing you need, you must have a digital model of whatever it is you're building, right? You must have a digital model of the thing you're constructing. Uh, and um, my preferred title for that is called digital engineering. Sometimes professionals call it BIM, building information modeling. But if you're building a road, it's not a building, is it? So you don't call it road information modeling. It just gets very confusing. You, you, need, a, you need a name for it. So I think digital engineering works for me. Uh, you can call it virtual design and construction. You can do what you like, right? Um, and that is the single source of truth for the asset that you're constructing. So uh, Langer Ork and others use the digital model for the three dimensions uh, in space, uh, the three spatial dimensions of the thing you're building. But they also put information in there around the, uh, the program, how long it takes to build, and the cost, how much it costs to build. So that if you change the model in real time, it changes the time and the price, right? Um, and then we use it for all sorts of things around logistics planning and other bits and pieces. Um, um, constructability and so on and so forth. So a couple of examples. Um, that is the digital model of a railway crossing being removed in Melbourne. I know it doesn't look like it, but that's what it looks like from underneath. Um, and that's where all the complexity is. So anybody who's ever run a contractor can tell you that uh, all your risk is in the ground uh, and you really need to know what's going on in the ground, right? So this is why we model the underside of the things just as much as we model the top side. Um, but this uh, project was really interesting for one reason. Um, this was the first project in Australia where we explored in anger how you engage with the community about what you're going to build in advance of it being built. So anybody who's had building next door to their house can tell you it's really disruptive and folks don't like it, right? So this gentleman, I have to, I have to caveat here. I don't, have his, I don't know his name. I don't have his permission, um, to sh but I'm using the Oral-B defense. Right, you remember the Oral-B ad, so you couldn't see the dentist's face on TV? Right? So this is the Oral-B defense, right? Um, so this guy lived uh, next to the railway station, and he came into one of our open days, the community engagement days, and he was really cranky. And he thought that his view from his front steps was going to go. So what we did, um, we popped him in a virtual reality headset, uh, and we, um, one of the engineers had a little joystick, and he took him for a walk through the new railway station. And then they took him up to his front steps, and he had the perspective inside the model of his front steps. And after about six hours, he grabbed the remote control, and then he started doing it himself. Right? So the number one reason, from my perspective, to do digital is that you engage with your stakeholders, um, whether your stakeholder is a member of parliament or the bloke who lives down the road, and everything in between. Right? That is where the power comes. Um, so today, this is a quick grab, one of our internal videos that we show when we develop stuff, what it looks like. Uh, this is the cutting edge for us for VR at the moment. Um, some examples from Brisbane Airport inside a large commercial building in North Sydney. That's, that's a model, um, but that's what it looks like from your 27th floor, and, and that's a real map of Sydney. So you can engage in real time with what you're going to get, what it looks like. Um, we have to be hardware agnostic, so there are Oculus headsets and 
Samsung Gear headsets, and these are Microsoft HoloLenses that are really interesting because they don't have a cable. We had to illegally import these into Australia because they weren't available here yet. God bless Canada. That's a great way to get this stuff if you need it. Um, and here's an example from one of our live defense projects, again, where the interest was what was underneath. So this was the first general who's ever crawled on a floor with a virtual reality headset to look at the foundations of, what, of the building that he's getting. So, um, and we get a thumbs up from uh, his chief of staff. So that's all good. Um, uh, this one I don't have permission to show you, so uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Um, you won't be able to tell anyway, but this is a, an incredibly, incredibly complex model, um, uh, incredibly complex model of a piece of work that's going on at the moment. Uh, and and it's, um, we use computer game engines to showcase this, because the cutting edge is in computer game technology. Um, and even the computer game engines uh, are struggling with the complexity of this model. Um, <laughs> So please, please don't tell. My, my um, chaperone from Langerook is, is shaking her head at me at the moment. I'm going to be in trouble now. So the, the, um, this project's really interesting because we had to make a digital model of something that already existed, right? You're not starting from scratch. So you stick it, you, um, you take a point cloud, and then you turn it into a digital model. And so you're doing it in reverse. Um, really interesting uh, project, incredibly complex. And the, um, the green that's in there are the things that are being changed over time. And you, you can uh, look at workflows and how you get equipment in and out and, and how you keep the public away from the construction zones and a whole bunch of stuff like that, right? And that's the point cloud model of the thing that I'm not supposed to tell you what it is, so. All right, so step number one, you must have a digital model of the thing that you're building. Doesn't matter what it is, road, railway line, uh, uh, social um, thing with sales. Um, the second thing then is you can use different delivery methodologies that are different from the way that the um, pyramids were constructed to deliver your asset. So the one that we like to use is called design for manufacturing assembly. Um, it is not our idea. We pinched it from aerospace. And this is how it works if you buy an airplane. So um, you have a digital model of the asset. You break it up into components. You then have those components manufactured using an outsourced supply chain. Whichever factory where anywhere in the world has cost, uh, a good price, time, availability, quality control, et cetera, then you bring those components together and you reassemble them, right? So I use an example from Boeing. There's an entirely equivalent slide from Airbus for the, um, uh, for the A380s. Um, but I use the Boeing example because the uh, trailing wing edges are manufactured in Melbourne, in Australia, whereas there are no components made on an Airbus in, uh, in Australia. So uh, I'm using Boeing. Um, so this is what it looks like when you apply that model to an infrastructure project. Um, I worked for Rio Tinto a very, very long time ago. This is Cape Lambert, um, their primary iron ore export facility. It's one of the engines of Australia's GDP. It contributes more than its fair share and then some. Uh, Langerork has built most of what you see there over about 30 years in one form or another. Um, so again, there's a digital model of the asset. And this was the first time we made modules that were intelligent. They had their own computer chip on them. So the, the thing knew what it was, it knew uh, where it belonged, it knew if it was late or on time. Um, so these ones were manufactured offshore and brought in by boat. Um, so that's the model, and that's what it looks like going into place. So there's a bunch of reasons for doing this and a bunch of positive implications that come out of this delivery methodology, um, the, not the least of which is mental health for the workforce. So anybody who's ever worked fly in, fly out knows that it's pretty stressful. And I have never met a work crew that works as hard as these guys here. It's a four weeks on, one week off, 14 hour days starting at 4.30 AM. Uh, I, I last four days on site and I've had enough. I have to go back to, uh, to my comfortable bed at home. Um, so if you can drop these modules in, in a week, then you don't need to hang around. Uh, there are just a whole bunch of implications that go with that. It's, uh, I have an eight year old. He calls this a Captain Obvious, right? It's just so obvious. Why would you do it any other way when you've seen it done? Uh, this is what it looks like um, uh, for a building. Uh, we're looking at the one in the middle there that looks like a cheese grater. It's the Leadenhall building, but everybody knows it as the cheese grater building. Uh, you cannot tell the architect who designed that because he really gets cranky. Uh, Lord Rogers uh, is one of uh, the sort of star architects. Uh, um, and you can tell it. <laughs> You can tell a star architect they're different from an architect because an architect is just a normal person, but a star architect, actually the sun goes around them, right? <laughs> so the Leadenhall building is a beautiful building. Um, 
there was no wet concrete poured on that job above the jump form. I just want to show you a little clip. This is the, the, the video that was used in the bid. Sometimes there's two, but it's, it's almost always just one. That project at its peak had five. Right? And that's why it was delivered in two years, not three. Right? It was the only job in the GFC that was delivered on time. It's in the square mile of London. Um, so and if you're interested, that's the factory that made the concrete for that project. That is a concrete factory. Right? It's a factory that makes concrete. So people don't think that concrete's a sexy manufactured material. That is the most advanced robotics facility I've ever seen outside of Japan for building products. Um, so that's Langerok's uh, uh, manufacturing facility in the UK. So the modules, the steel frame for that came from Czechoslovakia. The services modules came from Ireland. The concrete came from the Midlands. Um, and it actually knocked about nine months off the, the time, not six. All right. Uh, and another example, this one's from the UK. We did, uh, we did a little drop-in bridge uh, over the M60, which is around Manchester. It's the ring road around Manchester, uh, one of the busiest roads in the UK. This was just a tiddler of a bridge. Um, it was uh, 300 and something tons, 350 tons, I think. Uh, and you can't close that road because it's a car park at the best of times. So we dropped it in overnight, one weekend evening. Um, but uh, we're doing a little job in South Australia uh, that makes that look like amateur hour. And, and so this is Darlington, the digital model. We're dropping in some bridge components here that are 180 meters long and 3,300 tons. Right? So you can imagine the complexity of that. I, the, it's due to go in in a couple of weeks. I, if this lecture was a couple of weeks later, I could have showed you a video of the thing being dropped in. Um, uh, either that or you read about it in the news, <laughs> one of the two. Um, so, uh, so you can see the planning that went into that. It, it's dropped in on these little uh, SPMTs. They're self-propelled modular transporters. Um, and the amount of planning that goes into where those go and how you get the turns right and all of those things is absolutely extraordinary. It is the most complex piece of engineering I think we've ever done, certainly that I've ever been involved in in, uh, in my career. Um, looking at clearances and other things. So I, I don't have a video for you. I just have to show you some of the modules being bought into place so you can get an idea of the scale of them, right? There's a whole bunch more of those that go together, so. Uh, we've even done it for uh, renewables. Sunshift is a spin out from the innovation lab that we run. Um, it's the world's first modular, can you turn the volume down please? It's the world's first modular solar farm. It can go in and then get taken out again when you're finished with it. So it went in in a week here and we took it out in a couple of days. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that um, that delivery methodology can be applied in any sector. Right? It's just a, taking the very best of manufacturing and applying it in a new space. Um, you get the idea. All right, so once you have a digital model, and remember we're stepping forward in time now, once you have a digital model and once you have a different delivery methodology, then that opens opportunities up for using different manufacturing tools. So I think everybody knows what a 3D printer is now. Does anyone own one? Have one at home? Yeah. You can, uh, when we first started looking at 3D printers, even the cheap, shitty ones that were coming out of university labs were a few thousand dollars. You know, that same one today you can get for $30 from Officeworks. Um, and it works the same model as, a, as, a, as an inkjet printer. The consumables are the expensive bit. You get the printer for free, basically. Um, so, and I, I've used this example for a couple of years now. I, I presume lots of people have seen it, but if not, that is the world's first 3D printed car. Right, you've seen that before? Okay, so here's some photographs of how it's built. 3D printers work the same as a normal printer. You just put down multiple layers like an old dot matrix and it builds it up in the third dimension. Um, this particular printer prints Lego. Uh, it's ABS plastic. So, there are, so I appreciate nobody wants to drive a Lego car, um, although my, my son would. He'd think that'd be quite cool. Um, so that's what it looks like. It's, it's a bit of an ugly duckling. Uh, I get that, but this is the first one, right? Um, and then they added all the other stuff, the substructure, the electrics, the drivetrain, and then they drove it down the red carpet. So very cool, that's uh, uh, late 2014. Um, six months later, that was it. That's what you could buy. Um, so the thing about this is, anything you see there is customizable for free. You can order your car with horns and a leopard print side panels if you want, for no charge, right? Can't do that with a Tesla, let me tell you, right? So, um, and that is the power of digital fabrication. Once you've drawn it, you can change the drawing as many times as you like, 
uh, and you get whatever it is that you want, and then you press a button and actually spits the other end, right? Um, it's, ma it's called mass customization. Um, but in the way of startups, that's what the 3D printed car looks like today, right? Because they pivoted. You've all heard of startups, they pivot, right? They pivoted to this. This is a still a 3D printed uh, vehicle, but it's a self-driven uh, commuter bus for taking people from uh, across transport hubs. Um, so you can still order these, but they're not available for a couple of years, but you can buy one of these, right? So that's what startups do. Um, uh, some other examples, this is a piece of work from uh, Airbus. Um, it's really interesting, it uses a, a tool called generative design. So you start with a solid block of, uh, in this case, titanium alloy, and then you run an algorithm, you take out a chunk of material, and you run a finite element model over it, and then you take out another chunk, run it again, another chunk, run it again, until you've got the minimum amount of material that gives you the structural performance that you need. Um, so you end up with structures that look like they've come out of the Alien movie, right? So this is their uh, piece from uh, their innovation lab um, uh, around a 3D printed motorbike. Um, here's some work from my other life. These are not my examples, but we do do work in, uh, in uh, biomed. These are cartilage. Um, so 3D printed uh, simple, uh, um, simple structures, cartilage for the nose and the ear um, and other bits and pieces. And the way it works is you, you print that, dunk it into a broth of stem cells and you colonize it, and then you get structures that look like this, and that's the final product. So do you remember, not very long ago, there was a Time magazine had a picture of a mouse with a human ear on the back, right? And that was the cutting edge. Um, that was redundant in about two years, and this has now taken its place. So you can see how things will progress over time and the pace at which they, at which they go ahead. Um, and uh, so this is basically my understanding of the cutting edge in this space. These are... Um, individual heart on a chip. Uh, it's a piece of work from MIT. Um, so you take a sample of your tissue, uh, cardiac tissue, and, you, and that is what's grown um, in a broth, and that's 3D printed onto these little chips, and then you can test uh, different uh, treatments against that, right? So it's personalized medicine using 3D printers, in this case for cardiac applications. And that's, uh, that's what the cells look like on the surface of the chip. Um, it's incredible. It's incredible stuff. You know, th there are no uh, body parts left that that can't be printed. They're not viable yet, but that 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 will come, right? And this is a piece of work from uh, one of the food labs. That's 3D printed chocolate. So you can print food. You can print body parts. You know. So my question here is: If you can print a body part, why do we still pour wet concrete in a project? W what is with that? Um, so we've been working on this for a while. Our, um, our solution to that problem is called FreeFab. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the world's largest 3D printer, sort of 30 meters long, six meters wide, uh, 12 meters wide, and six meters high. I can print a building with FreeFab if I want. Uh, we choose not to uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, but it's being used on another project I'm not supposed to name, uh, which is Europe's largest construction project at the moment. Um, just pay no attention to the little blue logo on the left-hand side there. It's, uh, it's not supposed to be there. Um, and there's James. He's one of the inventors. Uh, and this is really interesting because we're making molds for these double curvature panels for acoustic. They've got holes in them to uh, help with acoustics in a passenger tunnel. So, um, But we've printed um, uh, metals, um, all sorts of different material. You're not constrained by material. In the construction space, the last frontier was glass. You couldn't print glass. And MIT patented that last year. Uh, you can print glass, translucent glass, whatever you like. Right? Um, all right, so digital model, different delivery methodology, different manufacturing tools, 3D printers, et cetera, digital fabrication. Once you've done that, you then need to make the things that you make, you have to give them a nervous system. Right? They need to be intelligent structures. You can no longer have a dumb bridge um, or a building. So if this building, if a bus drove into the front, the building doesn't know it's been hit, doesn't know how badly damaged it is, doesn't know, certainly doesn't know how to fix itself, right? So all of those things we need to be able to, in, to deploy across our infrastructure. And what that requires is a network of sensors. So um, here's an example for piles on the ground. That blue thing there is called an Osterberg cell. Thank you to my um, geotech friends who explained to me what a ge an Osterberg cell was. That is about 100,000 uh, pounds. It goes into the pile. When the battery goes dead, it stops giving off data, and it's a single point of data, right? Uh, 100,000 pounds, that's just silly, right? Um, so the very clever people at Cambridge came up with a way of getting that information and more 
by using optical fiber. So this is a little job that we did in the UK. Uh, it's called the Francis Crick Institute. It's a medical research center at St. Pancras Station, uh, King's Cross is over here behind it. Um, so those foundations, the pile cages are all instrumented with optical fiber and that's 20 cents a meter, not 100,000 pounds. And it gives you really granular information about the performance of that. And what it's actually saying is that structure is over designed by a factor of three, right? Conservatively, it's probably 10, but I'm not allowed to tell you that, right? Because uh, it's embarrassing. So, um, but you don't know that and no design engineer or delivery contractor is ever going to give you a performance guarantee unless it's over designed to that extent, which is one of the reasons why infrastructure is so damn expensive, right? Um, because it, it's not telling you how it's performing in real time. Um, so this, uh, you might have heard of Thames Tideaway, the super sewer under the Thames in London. We're doing a little bit of work on that. That same technology we bedded into these shafts um, and the, the, get a bit academic here, apologies. But that graph in the right, you see the, the black circles are the data from the optical fiber and the red dots, the three red dots are the three Osterberg cells that do the same thing down, the, down that shaft. And what it tells you is there's a bad spot with the point that's out here. And everybody looks at three data points and one of them's out here and two are over here and they go, no, it's an anomaly, right? We just ignore it. But actually there's a problem there. Um, and we had to go back in and do some more work to get that right. And you would not have seen that at the granularity level that you get there. So it has implications for design correlations. It has implications for a bunch of stuff. Uh, but you're giving your infrastructure, building whatever it is, bridge, um, a nervous system. That's what we're doing there. All right, so digital model, different delivery methodology, different manufacturing and delivery tools, um, a nervous system. And then when you're doing that and, you're, and your asset, the thing you've built, is giving off information, it's giving off so much you're in the realm of what everybody calls big data, um, analytics, uh, um, and artificial intelligence, right? Um, interestingly, that photograph is all of the emails inside Langer Rock, Australia for one week in January a couple of years ago. Um, and we were looking at how the, the business is connected. Um, and it turns out it's a really interesting hypothesis between profitability and connectedness to the center. So I'll let you work out which are the profitable jobs and which ones were the non-profitable jobs. This is an example from uh, the Pacific Highway work up on the North Coast, um, where we instrumented one of the compactors with a, with a computer chip, and it was giving off data in real time about its performance. Um, so what it, what it results in is a heat map of quality, in this case, the compaction quality, but it could be anything, right? It could be uh, bridge movement, it, it uh, could be any of that stuff. So instead of having some bloke with a stick and a probe come back three months later and say, yep, that's good or not, that's not good, um, what you have is in real time a, a quality repository of the, uh, of the project. And that's simply an example of what you can do with big data, right? The analytics side is, uh, is incredibly powerful because you're doing it in real time. All right, so again, we're moving forward into the future. Um, the next thing I want to cover off is robotics, automation, and computer vision. Um, actually, that's around the wrong way. So in order to enable automation and robotics, you have to have a computer that can see first. Um, so uh, oftentimes when we talk about the sort of stuff we do, you talk about robotics, everybody thinks of drones. Um, so we first had a look at drones about six years ago, and there were two drone companies in Australia. There was a little startup from Sydney called Propeller Robotics, and there was a big US company that had Google as a foundation investor. Um, and they were doing some work in Western Australia, and they flew their drone into the side of an oil and gas facility, and it went boom. So then there was one drone company in Australia. Um, so um, this is now a commoditized service. You can go to the yellow pages. There are 170 drone companies and counting, uh, and you ring them up, and they'll have somebody out tomorrow. And they do things that look like this. Um, this is an excavation for one of the rail projects in Victoria, uh, and it's looking at how much was taken out and how much is required to go in. Um, again, the drone platform is not relevant. It's what you do with the data that's the important thing, right? So again, a commoditized service. It's gone from not existing at all six years ago to being a commodity today, right? That is the pace of change in this space. Um, actually, what I want to do, focus on, is not that, right? That, that is a solved problem. I want to explore this a bit. So this is a piece of work from Google. It's a bit out of date now. Uh, you might have seen it before. This is what the driverless car, Google's driverless car sees. So um, 
On the top of the car, you have a SLAM system. It's called a SLAM system, simultaneous location and mapping. So it maps in real time things that it comes across. Um, so uh, the car is on a green path, and it's forward projecting where it's likely to go based upon sensors in the car. And then the thing that in the purple boxes are threats. That might be a grandma in a Zimmer frame. It might be a kid with a ball. It might be a puppy crossing the road, any of those things. right? That just pops up in a little purple box. Um, now, the problem that I have is the SLAM system is more expensive than the Corolla that it sits on. So we're not going to instrument that at the moment. So we had to come up with a version of this that was not $35,000, but was 200 bucks. Um, so this is our solution. I, I don't normally show this. Uh, this is one of our internal videos. Um, uh, and you see it, it's, so it's a SLAM system that was $200. We had to take a Microsoft Connect Xbox and, and pull it apart and then get this out of it. And then we had to put our own code in. So that's Alex. And Alex was teaching it, uh, writing the algorithms. So artificial intelligence has to learn what it's doing. It, it needs to learn. It's like a child. It's learning. So this video is a bit embarrassing because we ended up with a racist, a slightly racist uh, computer algorithm. Uh, you'll see in a sec. So there were two guys here, Alex and Suket. Um, so Ket's from Sri Lanka originally. Um, and so it recognizes Alex in the green box. Very happy that's a human. Uh, but n no, oh, not sure, oh, no. Um, so, oh, chair, no, right? So what we're teaching it here is tell the difference between a human and a chair. Don't all fall over in excitement. I know it's not, uh, it's not sounding like much. Um, but eventually it, it gets it right, okay? And then once it can recognize what a person is and indeed what a person is doing, you can do things like this. Again, um, I don't normally show this because, so this is an application where the algorithm has now learnt if somebody's wearing the right protective equipment or not. So uh, Rod, um, we have an issue with biscuits going missing from our tea room at work. Uh, so this was a setup um, in, the, in the storeroom where the biscuits are kept. And uh, so it, it, it's looking for Rod if Rod here is wearing the right PPE or not. So the fact that Rod is wearing board shorts and Haviana sandals Right, you know, it's not picking that up yet, but it's saying yes, he's got a high vis vest on, so he's allowed in. He doesn't have a high vis vest, he's not allowed in. And then we were teaching it distances, so tracking if you're coming or going and proximity, right? So these next two slides are a bit Blair Witch Project. I apologize for that. They're taken in real time by a worker. Um, this is it when that system is now learnt enough that we can send it to a, a job site. So this is a rail project in Sydney, and it's learnt now what equipment looks like, what humans look like. So it's doing a scan from right to left, looking for people that aren't supposed to be where people are. So in this particular case, uh, people who are allowed to be where they are in green, people who are not allowed to be where they are, like in hiding in an electrical cupboard, are in red. So I know the guy is there in the cupboard, because I've seen this before. But I challenge you to see it as you go past. There's a guy hiding. He's worried about his job. You know, computers will take your jobs. So. Um, and then this was a video just from the other day where we take it now to a, a, a warehouse. It's not, not a Langer project. This was done for Toll, um, uh, looking at whether you can instrument forklifts. They've got a lot of forklifts, uh, whether you can give them computer vision systems, and if they can be intelligent enough to work out if it's a real threat or, or otherwise. Um, and I think it can. Cool. I think it can. All right. So that's computer vision it's with AI up and down and stuff. It's not great. Um, but actually, right, so I, I think we'd all agree that this is quite a way from uh, being uh, commercially viable. Um, so again, this is the difference between research and, and application. Um, so it's not great. Um, but actually, the real reason not to go down that path is that you're enabling the wrong behavior. So there's a piece here around human psycho psychology and human, human behavior. Uh, construction can be a macho environment. Uh, so if you've got people who can lift 100 kilos and you give them an Iron Man suit that means they can lift 300, actually what you're doing is reinforcing the wrong behaviors. Um, I don't want that and we don't need that. Um, but where we found a really uh, much more beneficial application is with specific exoskeletons that do specific things. Lumbar support, support for joints. Um, well, the one on the, um, the right-hand side there is a supporting arm that's not actually attached to a human that helps you lift things in place. So that. So that piece of cast material weighs about 30 kilos. And Jin is a strong little fellow anyway, but he's actually lifting that with his pinky. Right? And it's enabled by that, uh, by that arm that's there. This is a much better solution, and it's uh, much more simple. The Iron Man suits that you saw before are several hundred thousand dollars each. Uh, these solutions are about $500 each. 
uh, much more enabled, more likely to be um, things. All right, so we're getting towards the end here. Um, uh, I get asked a lot, is the future of construction giant 3D printers printing buildings um, and, and that sort of thing? I actually don't think it is. I actually think it's micro, not macro. Uh, so this is a lovely piece of work um, from a university in Pennsylvania uh, that to start in its own TED talk a few years ago. Um, so what they're doing here is they're building a structure. Uh, so it's the same thing, digital model, D DFMA, design for manufacturing assembly methodology, where you break it up in com components and then you're assembling it with a robotic workforce um, in real time. So what these clever little cookies did, they solved the maths for swarm theory, right? So you know when uh, um, birds or fish balls or insects move, they don't bump into each other, they move in concert. So that's what they've done here. So there isn't a lab full of PhD students in the back with joysticks moving that around. Uh, it, it's able to solve the construction in real time. So if one drone with a piece is in the way, it can reprogram and go and pick up another piece. Um, so they are cheating a little bit here because they're using magnets to click it into place and that sort of stuff. But I, I do see a future where you have these digitally enabled uh, digital fabrication systems that are assembled by autonomous means in real time, 24 hours a day, um, on the basis of the model, right? That's, I think that's where we're heading. Um, and then again, when I talk to construction professionals, they're like, do you know, Andrew, that's really interesting, but we just don't see that. Um, so my answer to them is this. Um, I'm not worried about what happens in, inside the industry. I'm concerned about what happens outside. So Google did a market sounding for a new headquarters in California a little while ago, and the prices they got back were astronomical. It was a really complicated building. Um, and they decided, bugger it, we can do better than that ourselves. So in a very short space of time, they came up with this thing called a crabot, half crane, half robot, right? And then they prototyped it and patented it in a couple of months, uh, and they will have committed to use it for the internal installation of their new, their, new, their new building, right? So that means there's an entire construction company that bid a $3 billion project that's not gonna get any work out of that, and Google's gonna self-deliver it, right? So that is the future, that is disruption right there. There's an industry at risk. Um, and a couple of observations about that. So there's a lovely piece of work that was done in Australia recently looking at the impacts of automation. Uh, they call it computerization. So robots, computer vision, AI, all of those things lumped together. Um, and it's based on a US study uh, using the same methodology. And it breaks jobs up into job classes. So each little thing you do in your job, you look at what the impact on that task is, and then you create those into job families. So what they found was it's very much a bimodal distribution. Right? So um, it turns out that um, flipping hamburgers and cutting hair are really difficult things to automate and probably not worth it. Um, but if you're a paralegal and, uh, and your job is to review case law to structure an argument, uh, actually, you're redundant already because there's a computer that does that better than you can ever do it and covers all the case law and it does it near instantaneously, right? So, so actually, the impact is mostly going to be felt in white-collar jobs, not blue-collar jobs. Um, and what it looks like for Australia is most of the implications are in the regions because uh, farming is already pretty... Uh, um, it's a pretty automated sort of thing. You've got a gigantic combine harvester with, that runs on GPS with a single farmer dealing with 40,000 hectares in, in the West, right? So the key here to a future-proof job is to have a deeply creative element to it. So the key to a future-proof job is to have a deeply creative element to it. And it turns out that creative people want to work in creative centers, which are usually in the CBD, right? So if ever evidence was required that Australia needs a high-speed rail network or a hyperloop network or something, there it is right there. You have gotta get people from where they can afford to live to the creative centers and back really quickly. Um, all right, so I hope we're doing okay. We're covering lots of material here. It's certainly well outside the realms of a, of a normal chemical engineering lecture. Um, but we're going to go back to chemical engineering at the back end here. Uh, and we're getting into the science fiction-y stuff. Um, my lab does what is known as biomimetic engineering, deriving inspiration from nature. Um, and it turns out there are some lovely examples that you can apply in construction as well. So you might have seen this before. This, this work is not mine. It's from a professor at uh, Tokyo University, won the Ig Nobel Prize for Physics a few years ago. So the, the Ig Nobels are the alternate Nobels. 
for research that should not, cannot, or shouldn't ever be repeated. That's, uh, that's how it goes. So that is a map of Tokyo, right? The rail network of the greater um, Tokyo Basin was developed largely after the Second World War. Uh, millions upon millions of man hours uh, went into the design of that and its, um, and its optimization. Um, it's a very, very complex piece of design work. This is slime mold. It's a unicellular organism that lives to eat and reproduce. That is its sole purpose of being. Um, uh, this is what happens when you design a railway network using slime mold. So what this professor did, he got a petri dish, the shape of the Bay of Tokyo, and he put oat flakes in the major population centers. And the oat flake is the slime mold's favorite food. And then he put a dollop of slime mold in the middle, and then he waited for 24 hours. And the mold goes out, and it com comes back, and it goes out, and you get an optimized network that is really efficient at getting to where the food is, which happens to be the best way to get people between population centers, right? So when you run the maths over those two networks, um, the slime mold network is miles more efficient than the one that they've actually built. So think of the money you could have saved, right? So I just, I just need to, um, before I get into trouble, is there anybody here from Transport for New South Wales? Okay, few. This is what happens when you do it for New South Wales, right? So Rowan, uh, Rowan who's here in the audience, this is a piece of work he did for Langerook. Uh, oat flakes, mold network, that's what it looks like. That's what it came up with. I'm, I'm about to show you what it looks like when you compare it to the network. It's a little bit embarrassing. Um, actually, and actually, in New South Wales, it's not too bad. The slime mold, turns out we have a pretty lean regional network in New South Wales. I won't show you the one for Greater Sydney because it's a little bit embarrassing, um, uh, but so not so bad. So it turns out you can run that experiment 100 times, you get 100 different answers, and that's one of the things around nature because it's, it's an organic system. Um, but it's, it's quite interesting that um, when you go and seek different sources of creativity, you get, uh, you get different outcomes. Uh, and this is my favorite example. To, this is to finish now. Um, so this is a lovely piece of work from the University of Delft in the Netherlands. And this is self-repairing concrete. So it's concrete that fixes itself when it has a crack. Um, and what they've done here is the, uh, the, uh, the clever guys in this lab have identified a bacterium in the, in the, that's indigenous in the soil uh, in that region, and, um, and what it does when it's comfortable, it poos concrete, right? So they spray it on the surface, and then it, it, it finds a crack where it's, where it's wet and warm, and then it all gets comfortable, right? And you can see what happens, right? It fills in the crack, it's pooing calcium carbonate, right? So um, we, uh, we spent all this time uh, getting import permits to import a sample of this special brew into the UK, tested on uh, some concrete that we had in the factory in the Midlands. Um, there's no way to get through the biosecurity clearances in Australia. We didn't even try. We did it in the UK, and, uh, and uh, we sent some instructions to the guy in the, in the factory, and we said, look, um, you just squirt it on, and then leave it a couple of weeks, and send some pictures, please. So you know, two weeks later, nothing had happened. And we said, did you follow the instructions? Yeah, yeah, we followed the instructions. And then two more weeks, nothing had happened. And then six weeks, we gave up, right? It was, it was bunk. But it turned out, it was the middle of winter, and the experiment was at minus 10 degrees. The bacteria died, right? Um, it also turns out that that bacteria is not special at all. Any soil anywhere in the world, including in Australia, does the same thing. So we, we uh, ceased the IP negotiations to purchase that piece of IP, because uh, it's not required. You can go and dig a hole in, the, in your backyard, uh, mix the soil in a squirty bottle, spray it into a crack on the concrete wall, and it'll sort itself out. Uh, there's a free one if you've got cracks in your, uh, the facade of your house. So, All right. Um, folks, I'm all done. I'll take you on a little journey there for where things exist today and what I think the future will look like and where the opportunities are. I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed it. So. so much, Andrew. Well, that was a truly inspiring look into um, construction. And Andrew, you told us that construction wasn't sexy at all, and I totally disagree after watching that. We've got about 20 minutes now for Q&A, and we've got some roving microphones. So we'll see if there are any questions. Anne. Hello, thank you for that. Best presentation ever. I'm Anne Moore from Plan Do. I have a question for you in relation to the uh, biological models that you were looking at uh, referring to swarming. 
Uh, in nature, we look at murmurations, uh, which is uh, why we don't have uh, mid-air collisions of beasts that are flying around. I sometimes imagine what it would be like if our organisations were airborne and how many near misses and mid-air collisions there would be. How long do you think it will be before organisations adopt a more biological, um, real-time model like a murmuration instead of a command and control mechanical structure? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, I, don't, I really don't know what the answer is, uh, to be perfectly honest. Um, uh, that's, that's sort of a question about change, uh, and change is really difficult to do. Um, so even if there's a better way and you can take somebody to it, um, it, it's, still, it's still a difficult thing to do. So I, I know when we look for inspiration in different places, we get lots of it from uh, natural examples, and I gave a couple tonight, generative design, that swamp theory stuff, it's not from us, it's from that lab in, uh, at Penn State. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we always see a better way that comes out of that. Um, is it perhaps that um, there is more efficiency in a biological model? Nature's pretty um, clever yeah. at getting the best possible outcomes with the least amount of energy. So yeah. would that be one of the propositions of uh, moving I'm, to something like that? I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's the case. Um, we're big fans of, of sort of biomimetic design and the efficiency that comes out of it, the, the, the crispness of the solution. I didn't say that right, the crispness of the solution. It's always very elegant, um, but it often looks nothing like what you expect. Yeah, so. Another question down here. Yeah, he, we actually need to have security take him outside. Oh. <laughs> uh, excellent talk, Andrew, thank you. Uh, it's good to see slime molds getting the public profile they most richly deserve. Sorry, this, this, uh, this is Rowan. He did the slime mold experiment, so. It's uh, hopefully a Dorothy Dixer. There have been a lot of talk tonight about the role in our, I guess, social fabric, about we need an ideas boom, we need innovation, we need to create this sort of wealth for the future through our innovation ideas. Uh, and that's come from both you and the Minister. But what public role do you think groups like the Engineering Excellence Group and other associated research institutions can play in actively creating that space? Because I see a lot of discussion happen, obviously, as of tonight, but often we preach to the choir. So how can we extend that out into the general society and generate the same excitement that a lot of the ideas in your presentation have generated in the audience tonight? I told you we should have had security um, uh, deal with him. Uh, Rowan, lots, and lots of really interesting things in there. Um, uh, I don't think, so I've got a multifaceted answer that probably won't cover off on all of that. I don't think scientists and engineers communicate enough to broad audiences about what they do, how they do it, and why it's exciting and amazing, number one. Um, when they do that, uh, like what we're doing tonight, I, I've never seen uh, negative responses. So I know we, uh, the Engineering Excellence Group at Langerook has an extraordinary program of trying to engage with schools and young kids um, and get them excited about STEM. And actually, it shouldn't just be STEM, it should be STEAM. There should be arts and a, and a broadly creative piece that sits in there as well. But that's a, that's a debate for another time. Um, and again, when you do that and you can see exciting career pathways and other bits and pieces, when you're telling that story and it's re repeated again and again and again, people see there's another way, there's a better way, these are great careers to do, these are the sort of stuff we should be getting behind. I think that is the solution to, um, uh, to, to turning the direction of the oil tanker that is education in Australia. Uh, and the implications for society that go with that. So. Another question over here. Thanks, Martin Thomas. Um, Andrew, you've given us a wonderful pathway of innovations that are beyond the imagination of, of all of us, or most of us certainly. Would you care to speculate what is just over the horizon in the fields of travel, health and those sort of things. You seem a most imaginative guy and I'm sure you've got the answer that we haven't got. I don't think so. I think, uh, I think I've sold you a furphy there. Um, transportation. Um, uh, wow. So there are lots of really interesting things happening um, around personalized transportation and then long distance transportation in, in fast distances. I think most people have heard of Hyperloop now. Uh, we're interested in that. I think there's opportunities there, particularly for a country like Australia. If you can deliver long linear assets cheaply 
and cover large distances at low per kilometer costs, that is the, that is the solution for us. Uh, it won't be high speed rail. We've been looking at that for 80 years. Uh, we, just, we just won't be able to do it. There isn't the, the will, the intellectual capital and the, and the financial capital to get that going at the moment. Um, but maybe it's something else. Um, uh, around health, um, the, the most interesting thing that I've read in that space is around what's known as the singularity, um, where the human body um, is cured of all illness and lives to its full potential, which seems to be about 800 years, give or take, depending on what people think, right? So when you don't get sick of things and your cells don't die, that's, that's how long it lasts for. And depending on who you read, the singularity will occur in 2040 something, right? So uh, there are some very well-known uh, futurists, including the guy who runs Google's XLab in the US, who are trying to eke out their lives to get to the singularity point <laughs> by taking a ridiculous regime of vitamins and running on treadmills and stuff like that. So, um, but, but beyond that, I, I, I genuinely don't know. So. Another question. Yeah. Um, so you Thank you first for the amazing talk. It's very enjoyable. Um, I was wondering, like we've, we've touched base a lot about um, like construction and automation and like how innovation can take place in that aspect. Uh, but I was wondering how that will take place in a bigger aspect of things like sustainable cities, like sustainable designs in the overall cities and major cities and how innovation can take place in a sustainable way with waste reduction, material, and construction, of course. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we have lots of examples that I didn't cover at all about. Um, low carbon materials, uh, recycling everything you use. So, you know, the next, I talked about design for manufacturing assembly. So you're designing something so that you can make it and install it uh, really easily. DFMA, design for manufacturing assembly. But actually the next iteration of that is uh, design for manufacturing assembly and disassembly and reuse, right? So that um, you're using the model that Xerox pioneered for their photocopiers. So you buy a new Xerox photocopy called industrial ecology. So you're mimicking natural systems where the waste from one is always the feedstock to another. Um, so you buy a new photocopier and 90% of it is recycled parts. Uh, you don't know that because the outside looks all new and shiny, but they are refurbished in internally and then you're paying for services. Um, so per page as opposed to you buying the capital cost of the photocopier. That model applies for everything you can think of including cities, if you like. And there are people working on that as we speak. So there are lots of um, wonderful initiatives in Australia and abroad around smart cities, sustainable cities, uh, making places that are living places, that uh, repair themselves, that are uh, beneficial for the, everybody who's in that environment, as opposed to the, um, the old human models where you come in and conquer your environment and you, and you bend it to, uh, to your will, which are, which are unsustainable models for delivery of that sort of stuff. So I see the sort of things that we talked about tonight as being little steps that help make communities sustainable in future, and we'll get there in time. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Your talk, for me, and perhaps for many others, has been truly transformative. Um, in this context, you mentioned the beneficiaries of what you talked about tonight as being our grandchildren. And tonight, for the first time, I suddenly feel a lot of hope and optimism and, in fact, envy of the, life, the lives they're going to lead because of the world they're going to be in. There is a prevailing uh, thought that uh, people like me, my generation, has left our grandchildren a world which is going to be totally stuffed. But I think what you've shown tonight is that there's a way out of that and a way around it, and they're going to have a much, at least an exciting as, as, uh, exciting as lo lives as my generation's had. The question I wanted to ask is, you've clearly demonstrated how, how all of these things can be done and, and even though I don't grasp most of it, I can see where it's going. So it's possible to more efficiently use materials and, and do those things. What about the cost? The cost of developing the systems, these monitoring systems, you know, all those things, um, is, it, is the nine months that you save in the three months construction, three year construction program enough to pay for the cost of 
developing and implementing all these, say, these new systems, say, on that, that building you were talking about? Yeah, so in, in the long term, absolutely. It uh, pays for itself in spades and then some. Um, a couple of observations about your earlier comments. So I, I'm still worried about what my kids will do. I don't have grandkids yet. Um, uh, my kids are only sort of all under eight. Um, and I know that um, we have to prepare them. So I'm very passionate about education. Um, I've been in universities for most of my career, dipped in and out to do startups occasionally, and, but always come back again. Um, and I really like the tension between academia and industry. Um, but I'm concerned about how we educate kids today uh, from school all the way through university and that the focus on creativity and solving problems is, is, is not as strong as it used to be. Um, and I know that none of my kids, the thing that they will do in their careers, the things that they will do, because they'll have multiple things that they do, um, none of them exist yet. So we're trying to educate my kids for careers and jobs that don't exist. Um, so that, that's the first thing that needs to be fixed, and, and we're, not, uh, we're not even partway down that path yet. Um, um, Langer Walker is a really unusual company, and I really enjoy working there, and I'll tell you why. If, um, if I have to, it's privately owned. So if I have to report to a quarterly earnings cycle, we don't get to do any of this stuff, right? Because the payback period is, is well beyond a quarter. Um, and there are still commercial pressures that go with that, and we still have to deliver, but it gives us an environment to be more risky than you ever get away with in, a, in, a, in an illicit equivalent. Um, and that means your opportunity space is much broader and your, and your, and your chance to do something that is transformative is, is, is increased as a result. Um, so there are lots of places that exist like that around the traps, not just in construction, but in every industry. I can, I can tell you who our equivalents are. I used an example from Airbus, and um, I've been through their innovation lab a few times. It's just outside of Paris. They do extraordinary things, and I can tell you that all of the ideas that I showed you tonight that we're applying in construction, they've already applied in aircraft. They 3D print uh, wiring looms, and um, they've got little uh, cobot robots that go with each worker that carry the heavy tools and do the heavy lifting. Now, that, that stuff exists in their manufacturing facilities today. So in a way, what I'm doing is really easy, because I just scan the universe for ideas and say, yeah, let's have a crack at that from there and put it over here. I don't tell Langer Rook that. I tell him we invented it from scratch, and it was really difficult, and I probably need a raise. But you, you get the picture, right? So. Yeah, don't, please don't minute that, Sarah. Hi, Andrew. Great, great journey you've taken us on. Artificial intelligence underlies a lot of what you showed us tonight and had the great example of the, the uh, machine learning about people in chairs. And so the artificial intelligence is quite good at replicating what it's been shown. And really, it can only replicate what it's been shown. So is there a point where you think the artificial intelligence is going to be, become creative and to solve problems it hasn't seen before? Yeah, that's a good question, that. And the, the, from my perspective, the logical extension of that is when will the machines take over, right? So I'm not a roboticist. I'm trained as a chemist and a chemical engineer. Um, and, I, and I do work with leading roboticists now. The Center for Robotic Vision, Sydney Uni's Robotic Center is one of the best in the world. Um, but I'm not an expert. And when I ask experts, they don't know the answers to, that, to either of those questions. Um, so I think, in all probability, uh, AI systems, computer systems, will learn to be creative um, eventually. Uh, and my, um, I have a much more bullish take on the speed at which the future will appear than most people, as you can possibly imagine. Um, so I think most, stuff, most of this stuff is a couple of years away. Um, I sp spoke with um, the head of strategy at one of the large motorway global motorway companies recently who didn't think autonomous vehicles was, they thought it was at least 25 years away and they didn't have to worry about it. And I'm like, mate, you buy a Tesla, like off the shelf does that together, and they don't think it's an issue. Right? So I actually think it will come. I think it will come quicker than everybody expects. I don't know what the implications of that are once it gets here. And I'm, I'm genuinely concerned about that. There has to be a master kill switch somewhere to turn it all off. Otherwise we get what everybody calls the Skynet scenario from the Terminator movies. So. You, um, you hinted a couple of questions ago about how innovation is done in some ways by comparing to Airbus and say, well, I just I, I see what they're doing and, and a lot of the things are transferable. Could you, without being completely exhaustive, um, survey some of the knowledge flows that make innovation happen at Lango Rourke 
Um, is it mostly outside in? Is it the way you structure within? Um, is it, is it um, academia to industry, which you've touched on uh, briefly? Uh, and roughly what proportions would you put it down to? So it, it's certainly all of those things. We actively scan for ideas in every place you can imagine. The cutting edge in exoskeletons is defense, you'd be unsurprised to hear. Um, and they don't make their way to the market um, in a very timely fashion. And we get glimpses of them here and there and the, the research groups that they've sewn up that have developed a new exosuit for, uh, for uh, super warriors and that sort of stuff. Um, so we're, we're constantly doing that. That's probably 20% of our time. Um, the incremental stuff, the ideas we get back from the business about where there's a challenge and what we can do to help that, is probably 60% of our time. And then the things that we develop internally based upon our knowledge of both of those things that are more middle, middle term are, are the balance of that. So I was being a little bit disingenuous when I talked about the two types of innovation. There's also time horizons that go with that. So we have the two types and we have the horizons. Horizon one, horizon two, horizon three. Horizon three is the longer term, greater than five year disruptive stuff. Horizon one is 12 months and horizon two is sort of a couple of years. And, and we have a balance across those portfolios. We've probably got time for in your views on um, intellectual property and commercialization of some of the innovations we're talking about because you gave a couple of examples like your concrete one for example where you did sort of an end run around their IP um, but most of our funding models in Australia are based like whenever government decides to support something it's always based then on well we'll commercialize the IP and that's where the revenue stream will come from etc etc how sustainable is that model and and should we be I mean if you're looking at in software, people have gone open source and stuff like that. In engineering, is there more scope for that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's a good, good question. My, um, my IP model is it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. And that is the guiding principle for all of that. So what I've discovered in the construction, engineering construction sector is uh, everybody is a fast follower. So when somebody does something that gives them competitive advantage, whether there is a patent in place or not, everybody will follow it. And they will follow it quickly and aggressively. And you simply cannot protect that using the usual mechanisms. Um, you'd be in court until the day you died, right? It's, it's not viable. Um, so everything that we talked about tonight, uh, we have a very large and secure IP portfolio around the 3D printing tech because we see the applications of that exist outside of construction. Um, and that will be defensible uh, and potentially very valuable. Um, everything else, we don't, we don't bother. Um, because um, Australia has this really cool phenomenon known as the tall poppy syndrome where you poke your head up, you get right? And so actually what you need to do in order to enable change is you want to bring the bottom up, not the top. Um, and you do that by having everybody follow and you bring it up that way. Well, that's what we've, that's what we've tried and that's what we've discovered. Um, so uh, when we first started talking about digital engineering six years ago, nobody called it that. And now most folks do and that's good, that's positive change. And then we introduce the next stuff and now any contractor you like will do the digital stuff that we've talked about tonight. And they do it not because we do it. Um, they do it because it adds value and it saves them money and it delivers uh, improvements, right? So that, you know, that's what we're doing. And there's no IP that sits around that. It's just know-how. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you that the model in Australia is a bit cactus. Uh, I think if you objectively look at any evidence around commercialization income from IP, it's two-fifths of bugger all. And I think, I just don't think there's any, uh, there's any point in pursuing that. It's like, that's a dead horse, you can just get off, so, yeah. Very good, well thank you ladies and gentlemen and thank you Andrew. I'd now like to invite um, Ms. Cathy Jones, the Deputy Chairman of the Warren Centre to give the vote of thanks to the speaker. Well thank you so much Andrew, that was absolutely fabulous. And I think that all of the audience will join with me in saying that we'd love to continue that conversation for quite a while. So it's really terrific. And um, I, I, I'm actually really interested in the idea of a slime-based transport system. <laughs> so, um, and I think you certainly sort of answered for us and gave us lots of thought around the minister's challenge, you know, and how do we actually um, address the fact that we're an economy in transition and, and that, you know, you, you told us how to look to the future for some of those ideas. And I, I'm, I'm also very interested in my slime-based transport system when I, um, the notion that we're actually ready for another big revolution, another big disruption. So um, I'm, thank you so much, it's fantastic. 
So I'd also like to thank the sponsors tonight as well, and that's um, Lang O'Rourke and the University of Sydney's Faculty of Engineering and IT. And um, congratulations, and please join me in um, thanking Professor Harris. So I'm the last uh, person standing between you and a bite to eat and a drink. Um, I'll give thanks again to Lang O'Rourke and the Faculty of Engineering and IT for, for sponsoring the event tonight. Um, the, last, uh, the last thing to mention before we uh, depart is, is an answer to uh, Rowan's awkward question about what are the innovators doing about social inclusion. Uh, the Warren Center this year has undertaken an effort called Women in STEM and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we're promoting uh, to, to young females to study science and technology and mathematics for longer until they leave high school. Uh, we're we're pro promoting to um, women in, in work how to start their own business and for those senior females in business how to break the glass ceiling and, and get to the board of directors of the C-suite. Um, if that's interesting to you, uh, connect with us at our next public event on November 21st and please join us next door. Uh, for a bite to eat and a drink. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon.